Good evening. Welcome to event five of South Indian SGR user group. Today we have a pretty exciting event planned. And uh, before we you know get further into the event, a little bit about ourselves. We are uh, we call ourselves the South Indian SGR user group. We are based out of southern India mostly. Um, before we begin, we are uh, happy to welcome one of the newest members to uh, our uh, our uh, committee. His name is Samad Baskar. But in a short amount of time, Samad will introduce himself. So let us go with opening remarks. So what uh, what is South Indian SGR user group? We are a a bunch of RF uh, software defined radio enthusiasts based out of India currently. Our area of interest vary widely from signal processing, wireless communications, RF for machine uh, machine learning for radio frequency, and we are a bunch of people sc uh, scanning from academia, industry, and uh, with deep research expertise. Uh, so you can follow us anywhere uh, on our uh, GitHub or Twitter or uh, currently we started a WhatsApp group as well. So you can uh, find us there. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, go to our community announcements. And before we go to our community announcement, a little bit about our group today. We are having a pretty lean strength. Uh, Mr. Appa Thusu has went for his uh, personal work and uh, Mr. Neil is out there attending uh, a conference on behalf of his industry. And uh, Mr. Rohan Sundar is currently not with us as he's out on some personal work as well. So today's uh, conference or today's session will be held by three of us. Myself, Aditya Arun Kumar, I was previously working in Brisk Infosec. And uh, currently, um, my area of interest in uh, communication systems belongs to signal reversing, electronic warfare, and applications and implementation using SDR. Uh, our, one of our next members is Balaji Narasimhan. Over to Mr. Balaji to introduce about himself. Balaji, you're good to go. Yeah, myself Balaji. Uh, I was formerly working in Brisk Infosec, and uh, my area of uh, expertise include physical layer reversing in wireless communication systems and uh, reversing embedded protocols in wireless communications. And apart from that, uh, I'm just trying to uh, pursue on my uh, learning the CAN interface part and uh, trying to do my masters on the same. Thanks. Hope uh, you'll be all having a nice event in. Or, uh, today. And on to our newest member. I'm most happy to introduce the newest member of South Indian SGR user group. His name is Mr. Samarth Baska, but he is running his own company called as RE InfoSec and is the technical director of the company. So, Mr. Samarth, on to you. Thank you, Aditya. Am I audible? Hello? Yeah, yes, but you're good to go, man. You're audible. Yes, I. I basically come from a digital security forensics background, so I deal with the investigation and I'm associated with the information security audits and forensic standards, which has to be carried out by the law enforcement agencies. So I'm aspiring to work in the RF field. So it would be a great experience and I'm a honor to join with SISDR team and hoping to have a great event today. Welcome you all to our event number five. Over to you, Aditya. All right, uh, let us get back to our basics. So let me move into my slides, uh, slideshow mode. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for you know accepting our invitation to be a part of SASDR. So let's go about it. before we proceed further to the uh, to present day speaker lineup. Let us have some community announcements uh, regarding Guru Radio Companion. On September twenty sixth, uh, GRCon happened. GRCon twenty twenty two happened uh, in uh, Washington DC. Pretty interesting things uh, have uh, went down since then in GRCon. Uh, one of our members, Mr. Neil Pandya, was able to attend it in person. And apart from that, uh, some of us are also planning on running it in person next year. Some major changes that we got, some uh, interesting updates that we got from GRCon where we found some interesting projects that were actually taking place in RF based machine learning. And there were some more projects that were uh, working with uh, GRDF, a wirelining protocol for uh, communication and transfer of RF signals uh, as data objects. And apart from that, uh, 
CTF uh, that happened this year was pretty interesting. The signal samples and the way the signal samples were built and the CTF was infrastructure was built was pretty interesting for uh, this year's Guru Radio Con. One major update is uh, GR Guru Radio version 3.10.2.0 has been released on um, has been released and uh, from December onwards, uh, from January onwards, 3.1 will be the official supported LTS version. GR Con, sorry, G GNU Radio is moving to the 3.4 down the line. So we are waiting for one of our presenters to join in. Mr. Bala has uh, a little minute. Sorry for the inconvenience caused from our end. So, uh, so today we have a pretty interesting speaker lineup. Our, speak, our first speaker for today is Mr. Tilak Maripilla. He'll be presenting about uh, primer to INS wiretap codes. Our second speaker will be Mr. Faika. Uh, he'll be presenting about deep learning for the physical layer with Siona. And uh, the, our, our final speaker for the day will be Mr. Sebastian Dudek. He'll be talking about IL, assessing 5G uh, IoT devices from wireless to hardware. So I think we have Mr. Uh, Tilak online with us here. So without further ado, uh, let's start with the first speaker. Uh, before we, I hand it over to Mr. Tilak Maripilla, uh, a little bit about yeah, Tilak. Yeah, I have known Tilak for quite some time now. So Tilak uh, labels himself as an explorer and an independent researcher. So currently Tilak is working in ITAS Innovations in Bangalore as a DSP engineer on uh, physical layer broadcast protocol. Before that, he was previously as a, working as an R&D engineer at uh, Fortinet Labs in Pune, where he was working on drones, embedded devices, and cybersecurity for the same. Tilak has huge interests where uh, both DSP and security uh, mixes with each other. So rightly, he chose uh, the topic for this presentation, which was much expected for us, a primer to YTAP codes. On to you, Mr. Tilak Maripila. Yeah, thank you, Aditya. I'll just try to present my screen. Yes, Mr. Tilak, you're good to go. All right, yeah, thanks. Okay, so welcome all. Uh, uh, th first of all, thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak here. So the, the to topic for today is uh, wiretap codes. It's just a small primer on this, and I'll try to explain the basic concepts around it. So uh, this is the brief outline. We'll go through the problem statement, the motivation of why I'm doing this, why I'm interested in this concept, a small story I'll present with that, and we'll go through YTAP model and some extra stuff. So yeah. So the problem statement, I'm sure most of us here or the people who are watching, we all know about this, right? I mean, this is pretty famous problem statement. We, we know Alice and Bob right from our careers. So, this problem statement is that if someone wants to securely transmit or send information between two users, how can we do it? Right from World War I to we knew how the various ways it was done, now in the digital age, how it is being done. Uh, we, we pretty much know about this problem statement. And today as well, that is the same problem statement we will be trying to solve uh, using wiretap codes. So now I'll briefly touch upon my motivation for solving this problem statement. So we know some of the existing solutions uh, for this problem statement, right? The key exchange algorithms. Uh, I think there's a message. Okay, uh, Aditya, can I can I go on? I think I see a message. Uh, can you repeat back? Uh, your voice was a touch bit feeble from our end, Mr. Tilak. Okay, you're asking me to repeat my whole uh, presentation again. No, 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 not a presentation. You're good. You're you're, you're live, Mr. Tilak. You can proceed. We okay, okay. Then you're good. Okay. So we saw the problem statement, uh, how can we securely transmit information from one user to other and the history about it. And the motivation for me to solve this problem is, of course, we see the existing solutions where a typical key exchange algorithm will help establish the keys on both the receiver and the transmitter side, which is forward, which is forwarded with the key plus an encryption algorithm. And pretty much these are all irreversible functions that we see in cryptography that are being used. Uh, whether it's SHA-256 or any other, most cryptography algorithms are irreversible functions, right? 
and they're difficult to compute back to the origin and that's the that's the prime prime reason why uh, they're so cool so 3 years back as aditya was saying in my introduction i was with a cyber security company uh, as a research engineer trying to learn and implement some electronics uh, for some cryptographical platforms some defensive security platforms that which they built and i always had this question i being from a electronics and a signal processing guy how can i relate with these irreversible functions right uh, are there any other ways are there any other ways i could find this kind of uh, irreversible functions in uh, of course there are some i i started getting back to my books in signal processing and dsp uh, there is aliasing the required limits that we should follow shannon sampling theorem that we should follow otherwise we can't get the information uh, back to the origin and some similar ideas were there but i was i was in more search of uh, a similar concept and and i was so fortunate to find this concept of wiretap codes uh, and and how and how they were so cool uh, let, let, let us go through that as well uh, and of course when we see in our life right there are many irreversible functions uh, for example the aging of a human being he could continuously age and he it is completely irreversible process maybe it's quite debatable in some other con- and in some other angle but th- there are many irreversible functions in, in in nature that we could take inspiration from and and i am quite excited by this topic <laughs> so yeah let's go and see uh, some of the uh, known topics of uh, application layer security and physical layer security and connect back this uh, whatever i was just speaking with so as i said for the problem statement we know the present application layer cryptographical solutions uh, whether it is defi hellman elliptic or defi hellman all these kind of solutions are there through which two legitimate parties who want to transmit with each other can use this protocols and get a key so that they could use that for the confidentiality purposes by using aes 256 or 128 according to their use and computational power requirements they can do that but is it safe of course we see every now and then all this kind of attacks that's happen and the news we don't know whether our data is safe or not but still we use these algorithms and now quantum is it quantum safe the quantum computing uh, arena is coming fast and uh, ibm and what not all the major companies are in this race to build good quantum computers uh, where shor's algorithm theoretically at least proves that it can uh, completely uh, break the existing algorithms at least some of them and it says when a powerful quantum computer comes it can do it can get rid of everything and the solutions for that as i see is quantum key distribution post quantum cryptography are there i don't want to touch upon that but they are quite interesting topics maybe that's for another day so yeah that's that's where we are right now and now with this president said let us see what the channel based security that is five 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 channel based security will give us of course it also has the main tries to solve the main problem statement to share the secret by exploiting the channel randomness when i say channel it is the wireless channel that we have right i mean when you have a legitimate transmitter and a receiver whether it's a base station to mobile or whether it's a wired communication or anything we have a channel wireless channel and it is quite random it has a lot of noise and here it exploits this important property of randomness of the channel to send the secret and here unlike the application layer cryptography it doesn't assume that the that the adversary has a limited computational capability because it says i'll offer a information theoretic security i don't care if there are a lot of computing resources but i'll still be secure because we know that quantum computing is good in a particular way which that element which is present in application layer cryptography and so it is safe it so it is not safe but here in phi the channel based security quantum computer cannot do anything the properties which this security mechanism uses there is nothing which quantum computer can do to it and say and hence we say given the unlimited computing resources that a quantum computer can bring to the table still this model could stay safe let's go with that statement and let's see how it how it goes we can discuss more on that 
So, uh, okay. All right. So now we saw about this application layer security and the channel based or file layer based security. But even in spite of giving file layer security to a good, to the receivers, is Bob or the legitimate receiver secure enough? I don't know. I mean, we are seeing it will be secure. I'm seeing it will be information theoretic secure. But uh, I'll, I'll connect with this with a small conversation I had with my colleague uh, with my, in my previous company. When we were building that uh, defensive security platforms, I had this question and asked him, how secure are we? I mean, we are advertising that we are so, so secure uh, and anyone who builds with our platform will be secure. But I asked this question at the basic, how secure are we? And he said, the question, the answer to this question of how secure are we ultimately boils down to how hard we can make a hacker for him to break through our system. If we could have multiple levels of uh, hardness for him, and if he's unable to break it, then we can say that the security level is much more, but probably we can never say uh, with the advancement of technology and the new ideas from the researchers that will come in, we can never say probably that a system is completely secure, right? As we see in the emoji, maybe the, the Bob cannot have a chill attitude with the specs on, but, uh, but probably, we can say that the hardness to break into the system by having a hybrid uh, security mechanisms like this application plus physical layer security that if it could be implemented in an OSI model that we that we see here, he could be much more safer. He could be much more safer. Yeah. So with that, uh, I'll just slowly go through the Weiner's wiretap model and what it is. So before that, I'll go through the small preliminaries. Uh, I'm sure th there are many experts here in wireless communications, but I'll just go through this uh, uh, definitions once again. Uh, channel capacity, the theoretical uh, limit that which a wireless channel could offer us or any channel could offer us for a non-error free communication uh, is given by this formula, bandwidth into log two, one plus SNR. Uh, it's, a, it's I'm, I'm so cool to see this uh, great theorem given by Shannon. What a great work, honestly. Uh, so such an inspirational uh, theorems, honestly. Uh, great. And secrecy capacity or secrecy capacity. So we saw channel capacity. And now what is secrecy capacity? So the wiretap model that I'll introduce, it tries to solve the problem statement. The problem statement which we saw in slide two, what is it? It is the confidentiality with which we could send between two parties. So, but the theoretical limit for such kind of a confidentiality information is given by secrecy capacity as the channel capacity of a legitimate receiver minus channel capacity of an eavesdropper. That is the theoretical limit with which the information that whatever I'm able to send is confidential. Even in spite an eavesdropper is there, he will not be able to listen to this information. And that kind of information's capacity is what this definition says as secrecy capacity. And one more final definition. Yeah, C is equal to CR minus CE and channel coding. Uh, we all use it. Wireless engineers use it. We all implement it because there are a lot of noises in the system. We need to do coding. Coding for whatever message blocks we have to turn them into code words using various code, code schemes, Hamming, Polar, LDPC, or the many coding schemes that we have, repetition, random coding, a lot, right? So that we will be able to tolerate any noises and send as much information as possible to, to achieve the theoretical limit of the channel capacity, which is, which is derived by Shannon. Right. So let's see the introduction of uh, the Weiner's wiretap model. We saw the the basic definitions that which were required. So as said, channel coding gives reliability. When noise or any kind of disturbances are there, it can help us in getting uh, the required symbols as transmitted as it is. Right. Then Weiner said that, you know what? 
using channel coding, we can also achieve confidentiality. That is the problem statement we are uh, here for today, along with the reliability without the use of any cryptographic methods. The cryptographic methods that we know of, uh, Diffie Hellman, RSA, AES, anything and anything. He says, don't even use anything. Using your channel coding itself, we can achieve the confidentiality. And how can we do that? He says, use the noise, as you said, using the noise present in the channel to transfer the secret where you should have an assumption that the eavesdropper channel is more worse or noisier than that of the, the, the good receiver, the good guy there who is not the eavesdropper, but he wants to get his legitimate information back. So his channel is good, but the eavesdropper channel is worse. That's what the assumption is. Let's go with that statement. I'll come back to it again, whether it's really practical or not. Right. So let's uh, pictorially see this uh, uh, using noise to transfer the secret or let's see how the eavesdropper channel will get deteriorated uh, in a binary symmetric uh, channel model. Okay. And now we will see how the noise will come into play. So here we can see that the uh, I'm sure everyone knows this binary symmetric channel, uh, what it is. It tells the probability of each binary state between uh, before the transmission and after the reception. Here, as you see in the left extreme corner, uh, Alice transmits to Bob and you see a binary state zero. If it is also the state zero in the receiver side, it says it might be with a probability of 0 0.9. That is, it says 90% of the time, whatever the information that he's transmitting, Bob will be receiving the same as it is. Because of the channel coding conditions that we have, probably it has increased. But still, because of some inherent noise that which is present, that which we cannot eliminate. 0 0.1 or 10 times we see that the state 0 becomes 1. That is inverted of what we send. That is that is not the one which we want. So it's an error. So 90% of the time it is what we want or what is sent and 10 times it is the other way. Similar with the case of binary state 1. Now if we see to the extreme right case where, the, where if there is noise, then we see that the initial probability that what we saw 0 0.9 for the same state to be transmitted and received, we see that the probability decreased from 0 0.9 to 0 0.8. So now the error is more. And hence we see that if, if a state zero is transmitted, it will go into state one by, uh, by 20 times. That is an increase by 10 times than the previous model where the noise is a bit less, right? So here we see how E is unable to decode the exact correct information which he's present for. Any eavesdropper, he should be there for getting the exact information, right? He wants to listen to the exact signal, exact signal as Bob is getting. Otherwise, his, his whole uh, uh, aim of being there is not so fruitful, right? So by having noise in his channel, Eve is unable to listen properly. Even if he listens, he's unable to decode properly. That's what we can understand from this uh, model. So let's see how uh, we can apply this. Here we see uh, a transmitter is uh, transmitting to a legitimate receiver uh, and, and an eavesdropper where X is the code word and H, X is the code word with this input and with all the required power limitations that are maintained and H is H and Z, sorry, H and Z are the channel matrices and Y and Z are the received signals, right? So we can model them as hx plus w, gx plus w, prime and w is the, the noise that which, which one could experience, which gets additively joined. And that's how the signals are modeled as. We all know this. And now, in such a scenario, how can we understand the secrecy capacity that which you already uh, saw in the preliminary section? It says, if the capacity of a receiver minus the capacity of a eavesdropper is done. Of course, provided we know that the eavesdropper channel is a bit worse. So we get a positive secrecy capacity, a positive value here as secrecy capacity, right? So for achieving that, the eavesdropper should have worse channel. And we can, we can see that the exp uh, expression here mod h square is greater than mod g square. Excuse me. 
So using that, we can see that the secrecy capacity is more. So that using that limit, tra the transmitter Alice and Bob could transmit and receive confidential information without the eavesdropper getting to know it. Let, let us see with a pictorial representation of how that would be. So here we see uh, the, the extra portion that which the receiver, the legitimate receiver has. That is the secrecy capacity. Because of that extra that which we say that which is achieved because of the because of the receiver's excellent channel conditions, he utilizes that extra cap for sending the confidentiality information, while the remaining part that the receiver also has on equal terms with the eavesdropper, it is used for having a head start in sending confidential information. And it helps in uh, making the eavesdropper getting confused because he doesn't have that much channel capacity, right? L let us see uh, in a more understandable model that which we all see, uh, all the wireless engineers or people who are interested in wireless communication see from a modulation standpoint of view. If, if this kind of constellation of a 16 com constellation is sent to the extreme left side, we see the legitimate receiver in green color. He's able to exactly decode the uh, constellation exactly because he, he doesn't have any noise. Of course, this is a this is a uh, assumption that we have. L let us discuss on that, as I said. But towards the right, the eavesdropper has a lot of noise and is unable to decode the exactly transmitted symbol by the by Alice or that which Bob has got. So here he's unable to get the exact information because he's getting confused with the noise. So the probability with which he could decode the same transmitted symbol is quite less, but his error is quite more. So uh, th that, that explains briefly the application of noise and uh, eavesdropper to achieve this secrecy capacity. But is it practical? Do we, uh, an eavesdropper who has managed to get into a network to be a real good eavesdropper, maybe he'll manage to even get a better channel state information as well, right? He might be having an equal channel capacity, uh, sorry, an equal channel, a very good channel uh, performance as with the legitimate receiver is. Maybe that's how his setup will be. So that's an interesting question. And the subsequent research uh, will not take th this assumption into consideration. And I'll, I'll I hopefully get many sessions after this, uh, where I'll try to explain that as well. Sorry. Yeah. So is that noise at you practical? Definitely not. So we will see the upcoming in, the, in some upcoming sessions. If I'm given an opportunity to, I'll try to present that as well. Uh, and the, the various scenarios that we have, CSIT was a CSIR the thing which we saw today is CSIT, channel set information at the transmitter. So the transmitter knows the channel set information H and G, that which we saw. But what about the scenarios of CSIR? So that's very interesting. And how about when we when I said about the channel coding, how that, that one effect with the various kind of error correction codes that we have, the advanced polar and LDPC. And, and the other advanced topics of using lattices. Uh, there are many good topics over there. I'll try to cover, because as I said, this is just a primer. I just want to have this foundation concept of how noise can be used. It's, it's a very basic concept, but I just want this to be presented for today so that on the later presentations, I could build upon that and present more advanced and things. Of course, even I'm learning as I speak, I'm not an expert. I'm just learning the uh, work that is made by the great researchers uh, and trying to present here so that we all could collab and work together. This is my invitation to all of you who are listening today and to all of the people who will be listening to at a future date. If you're interested in this topic, let's get together, write back to me or just, just in some way speak to me uh, so that we could collab together and learn together and work on these interesting concepts. Uh, again, uh, this is not on my schedule to speak to, <laughs> on the script which I wrote, but uh, I, I want to salute the great scientists who did this. 
all the researchers who are doing this great work right now as we speak they're they're not here with us today but i think their ideas their hard work the research paper speak for them so they're all present with us today in their research in with in the form of their knowledge and i i get emotional when i say this but i think it is the responsibility of all the researchers of at least the people who are interested to come back and work as a team so that in any any corrections for example i just presented some basics right now and i could be wrong in something and i want to be corrected i want to go with people to work on this so come 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 back to me or just just let us work together and and try to have some good time spending these topics working on this and i'll i'll do update the links on this presentation i'll i'll give to to the organizers as well on whatever interesting uh, things which i followed for this topic um, so that we all have a basic uh, reference to start a conversation when you write back to me so that when we all start working together or at least for my next session where if, as i said if given an opportunity where i'll start speaking based on these and for other people to refer back from thank you thanks a lot uh, please let me know of any corrections or questions or suggestions that which you have thanks a lot thank you Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Tilak. Uh, Mr. Balaji, do we have any questions from users end or uh, anyone else? All right. Well All right. Maybe I have uh, one question down to Mr. Tilak. Mr. Tilak, you were uh, showing that uh, constellation point, right? Uh, saying that the uh, noise present the probability of error for if to detect a single symbol would be far uh, lesser can you right. please tell uh, the assumptions behind those so do not get the draft uh, drift completely there okay uh, you you asked me to explain the the same concept yeah, again like, right? uh, why would you assume that uh, okay granted uh, the channel noise is always present exactly. but why would we actually assume that uh, eve's uh, channel model would be worse than uh, right yes as channel model in this exactly case. so that is definitely not practical right yeah i mean uh, th even i can't accept it so but with the initial work which winer started uh, that was the assumption uh, if noise is there that is what we can achieve but the subsequent researchers when they started their work they started solving that the exact question which you asked okay so uh, that's where i said in my future presentations i'll try to answer that exact question it's a very interesting question uh um, just like for any series or bahubali 1 2 we have this question right why something happened like that so the, <laughs> this is this is the thing which i have uh, i'll surely explain that uh, that is the main concept but just as a primer uh, i think this is where i landed yeah, yeah sure sure mr thank you thanks for the assist thank you so no more questions from uh, other and means i think we can uh, uh, I, i have a question if that's fine yeah sure mr fine kali uh, can go ahead yeah uh yeah is in this wire tap channel model uh to select the the coding scheme that enables the receiver the so it was the receiver was alice in this example to decode the channel but not eve does it mean that in addition to assuming that eve has a weaker channel you also need to as to assume that the transmitter so adam here knows both the nose level of eve and alice And then yes. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Faika. So you're saying. Uh, let, let me repeat your question. I think you're asking if uh, the transmitter knows both the receivers, the legitimate receiver and the eavesdropper, right? So that because yeah, you're sending exactly the channel that. matrices to both. Right. Okay. Yeah, but but yeah, but okay, but but I is just in practice. I can see how how the transmitter can get the the channel response from from the attended receiver. So Alice in this example. Uh, Adam sorry in this example by feedback but i guess the if dropper would not feedback the channel response to to the transmitter so it just i know it could be also a practical issue i guess to that to just to select the right coding scheme that we need to assume that both of the channel are known is my question clear so um, mr michael if i have to elucidate your question you're saying that uh, Despite whatever uh, Alice or Adam is receiving and Eve is receiving, the channel matrix present with them, both of them are same. That's what you're trying to ask, right, Mr. Faker? Yeah, or both of them needs to be known. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, to the yeah. Uh, 
if you consider but it on the top channel on its base, that's what they actually assume. Whatever channel okay. that both uh, Alice and Eva are seeing are the same channel. But Wiener's assumption while he was proceeding with this problem was he assumed Eve's channel model is always a bit uh, worse than uh, the other channel model, the legitimate receiver's channel model. So that was the premiere that uh, Wiener actually established. Okay. Them. Okay, yeah, okay, so that's... Yeah. So that for uh, yeah. his simplicity into Beck and BSC, he actually did uh, something like this, but currently our present-day channel models don't exactly convene with Beck and BSC, right? So... Mm -hmm. Okay. That's something, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's something that was boggling me as well, but that's a very good question. Thank you, Mr. Faika. And Mr. Banerjee, no more questions from YD and or Slack and right? All right, let's uh, go to our next presentation. Okay. Our uh, next presenter, you know, we were going back and forth with this presenter for more than like a uh, month, month and a half together. And uh, the entire team out there, be it Mr. Sebastian Kramer or Mr. Jacob Hoyders or Mr. Faikal, who is going to present today, were very patient with us on scheduling every each and every nitty gritty detail about it. So, uh, can, can I share my screen? Without further ado, I, yeah. before okay. I actually say I'm practically in love with the software that you guys have created, the Siona, it is beautifully built. And uh, <laughs> the system that it actually gives it uh, gives with the NVIDIA GPUs, uh, yeah. Let's say it was one of the dream come true softwares uh, for us uh, wireless guys and geeks out here. Oh. So, Mr. F uh, a short introduction about Mr. Faika. He's a senior research scientist at NVIDIA working on convergence of wireless communication and machine learning. I mean, uh, one of the hot topics currently that our uh, team's also looking into. Before NVIDIA, he was a research scientist at Nokia Bell Lab. Glad to know that uh, you are a part of Nokia Bell, Mr. Uh, uh, Feka. He's one of the maintenance and co-developers of CO. Uh, For a second, we have an intermittent power outage on our end. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, we'll, just uh, just give us some time. We are having some technical snags with respect to current. We'll, okay, yeah. uh, we are getting our stream back up now. Yeah, that's fine. Just do you want me to restart these slides maybe later? Yeah, let's chop. Or... Right. We can chop right here, Mr. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Faika, we are good to go. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah so I was a small request from RN. Can you please start uh, a little bit? You no, know, the image yep. red moment onwards because uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe from here. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. So I was yeah, from maybe the I can... image net, Yeah, from the image net, you can start, Mr. Faika. That will be better. okay. Yeah. So so Thanks. I was saying that. Yeah, I was saying that ImageNet was a big moment for the computer vision community because uh, it was the first time that uh, NAR network demonstrated some gains compared to what human can do in the computer vision task. Uh, and it also kind of triggered other research, uh, the use of deep learning for in other fields, including communications. And that's why in the, f in the next years, 2016, 2017, 2018, there was a few very influential papers on ML for communications. And following that, in 2018, the EEEE, that we are probably all familiar with, starting the, started this emerging technology initiative on machine learning for communications that was first led by Jakob Hoydis, actually. And uh, on my side, I was responsible for the, for, for the research library. And then in 2019, at least this is how we we perceived the uh, we perceived we perceived it is that there was some disillusions uh, in the in the AI, AI for communication field because there was still no no practical use case that were significantly benefiting from machine learning but what happened in the next year is that almost simultaneously there are some big organizations uh, such as the ITU and the IMT that have shared some data sets uh, and some task, a little bit like Kaggle, like what is done machine learning with Kaggle, to 
to uh, to motivate organization and academics to uh, to to work on this task using real data from the field and to see if they if AI and machine learning and deep learning can bring any benefits. Um, and that was that was the, that was a good idea actually for some of this task. So for some of this task, hundreds of organ of teams compu uh, um, competed. Um, so it has some big impact. And now, currently in 2021 and this year in 2022, the 3 GPP started to look at AI for machine learning first for data collection for new radio, and then now uh, AI ML for uh, new radio air interface is a high priority for 3 GPP. And this year, very recently, actually, I think a few months ago, uh, there was the first EEEE transaction on machine learning for communication networking. So I think it's safe to say that machine learning is in the field of communication and is here to stay. C can you still hear me? Is everything working? Hello. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. We, are, uh, up, okay. we are up and running. We are up, Mr. Faker. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And if you look at this, we 6G is foreseen for 2030. And all of this happened in six to seven years. So we have still plenty of time to develop the use of AI and ML in communications before 6G. Okay. So See what actually talking about 6G, what will be 6G is still a little bit in the air, right? Uh, no one knows for sure, but for sure there are a few topics that have emerged in the research community and are under a lot of active research efforts. The first one is to push the frequency higher, right? To, to move to the so-called sub terahertz spectrum. So starting roughly to 150, 30 gigahertz. Um, and the, the idea is that we, if if we, it's mostly the challenge is mostly hardware actually. And if we can, if this can could could work, then we could have order of magnitude of magnitude gains in the throughputs. Uh, a second very very hot topic is the use of these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces (RIS) to improve the coverage. Right. Um, then we another topic is this joint sensing of communication when the radio network is not seen only as a way to communicate, but also as a way to sense the channel, right? It's to turn the radio network also as a radar to sense the channel and bring some extra information that may be useful for some applications. So that's also under active research. Of course, there is this AI native R interface that we just mentioned, right? And that is starting to be investigated by uh, the 3GPP. So the idea is to use deep learning on the receiver, but also on the transmitter side to for example, design modulation, design codes, or design even waveforms. So this is this AI native er interface. And there is also the, uh, this idea of semantic communications, where instead of having this complete separation, which is between the applications and the physical layer that just seen the, the stream of bits, it's to use, to do some more advanced joint source channel coding to transmit information uh, to make the physical aware uh, physical layer aware of the what the application aims to transmit basically and finally there is to there is this idea of self-free and holographic mimo which wants to prove to push even further massive mimo and of course we are not mentioning a lot of applications that are also uh, in the air like the use of uav uh, federated learning etc but the the reason why we i mentioned this all these topics is because they all need a new tools. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that they don't only need new theories for which the on which the, the research community is actively working, but also a new tool to to test these these theories and also to rapidly prototype and evaluate these research ideas and this algorithm that will that will be designed by the researchers. And the first tool, the first thing that we think is missing is the need for uh, environment specific data that is not to not to rely on this, for example, this 3GPP channel models like UMI, UMA, RMA, TDL, CDL, etc., or simplistic model like Adobe and Riley, but to rely on data that actually have physical consistency and reflect more, more accurately the actual channel. For example, this would be required for cement, for uh, joint sensing and communication, right? Secondly, 
because AI and ML seems to be here to stay, we need a tool that can su support native integration of such algorithm, meaning that we want to be able to natively integrate a machine learning based algorithm, for example, in our network into a physical layer on the transmitter receiver side and to be able to propagate a gradient in an end to end manner from the receiver up to the transmitter and through every component being machine learning based or not uh, without much effort. And finally, we also need both very high detail and scale, meaning that, for example, if we want to scale to this, to want to do simulation for self-free, uh, for a self-free system, we need to scale to multi-cell system. But on the same, at the same time, we want to have, if we want to, for example, simulate very large bond weight or um, have physically consistent, consistent channel model, we need both scaling to multiple cells, but at the same time to have very accurate model of the channel at the physical level. And to the best of our knowledge, there is currently, there was currently no tool that allow this, that allows to tackle these three challenges, these three requirements for further research towards 6G. And that's how, that's why we introduced Shona, which is an advanced link level simulator that is GPU accelerated. It's a, right, so the idea of Shona is that first, we want to enable with Shona rapid prototyping of complex communication system, meaning that we want that without much effort, a researcher can prototype and test an idea, which is not just a simple simulation over an Abugian channel, but may, met with advanced channel model, standard codes, for example, DPC 5G codes and 5G, 5G compliant modulator and, det and, uh, and, and detector, for example. And so rapid prototyping of complex system that's required to move away from this simplistic simulation with Abdu'l-Gen and Haile channel, for example. Secondly, we want native support for our network. So if we want, if, uh, if someone wants to introduce in this link and our network, he can do it natively without effort because Shona is designed to support such systems. And of course, integrating our network is not only about implement, pushing a our network in the system, but also training it as part of the system with a realistic channel and LDP and coding scheme, for example. So that's why it is differentiable end to end, meaning that we can compute a loss here on the decoder side and propagate the loss through the entire system to train neural networks that will be somewhere in here. And every that's why we made sure that most, if not every components of Shona are differentiable, meaning we can propagate the gradient through them. And finally, because it is GPU accelerated, it is super fast. So if we are, for example, if you are used to running for loops to test, uh, to, gen to generate uh, block error rate plots, for example, this GPU acceleration that allow to fully embrace parallelization on GPUs is really a, a game changer because you can get a plots with high accuracy in a few seconds, in a few seconds or minutes. And there is two way to uh, to and also it scales to multi GPU, meaning that and there is two way to do that. Either we can implement part of the system on one GPU if it's quite big, another one on another GPU, or we can duplicate the system on different GPU uh, to, for example, increase the batch size. Right, so instead of running batch size of one hundred, running batch size of five hundred, for example. And finally, we went, we made sure that it is very easy to use. That's why it's written it's written in in Python. It is fully documented. We, we put a lot of love in the right of the document in the in the writing of the documentation to make sure that we actually understand what is in there. And of course, it is open source. Open source meaning that if the documentation for some reason is not enough, uh, you can also have a look at the source codes. Everything is on GitHub, and it is extensible. Uh, right. This is this comes from the open source uh, open source aspect, meaning that you can of course enrich Shona or replace any module of Shona being the channel, the decoder, as shown in this slide, the modulator, or whatever it is, with your own block to test your own algorithm and your idea. We have also made sure that everything is carefully tested. Um, for Because, for example, for the channel, we made sure that there are 5G compliance, that they satisfy the and same for the LDPC code. And as I mentioned already, it's free to use and open source. It's released and, and under the Apache 2 license. Okay, so some feature highlights of Shona. Uh, first, uh, we have a fairly complete 
fact, file forward error correction toolbox in there. So currently there is a support for 5G LDPC and polar codes with rate matching. Also read Muller and conventional codes. We have many detection algorithms implemented in there, belief propagation, SCSCL, VTRB, and also support for interleaving and scrambling and scrambling. Also, we have put a lot of effort on implementing current state of the art channel models. So we have support for the 3GPP 3891 models, TDL, CDL, UMA, UME, RMA. Also support for more simple channel models, which are quite nice to test, for example, simple idea quickly, like WGN Riley block fading. And, and this channel can be implemented, can be simulated in either the frequency domain, for example, to simulate an to simulate an OFTM system, or by using the full time convolution, which makes sense, for example, if we want to simulate high mobility uh, or uh, cycle prefix less communication or just delay spread that are higher than the cycle prefix duration where we need full time convolution. Also, we have support for multi user MIMO, uh, where we have support for the and for the antenna array and antenna pattern that are if that are described in the GGPP uh, specification and we have we have also support uh, we have also implemented a bunch of uh, channel estimator detector uh, algorithm for example zf precoding is there lmms and maximum likelihood detection uh, as well as least square uh, channel estimation with many different approaches to uh, interpolate the the, the channel um, and it supports multi cells, of course. And also, there is a support for a 5G compliant to FDM resource grid, meaning that we can implement the 5G compliant pilot pilots, for example, or, of course, design um, custom pilots patterns in the 5G grids. And so, yeah, it supports arbitrary pilot pattern and also support the 5G the 5G Kronecker pilot patterns, for example. So currently, we have this question estimation. Actually, LMMS channel estimation is coming soon, and we have different interpolation methods. For example, you can, so once you have estimated the channel, the pilots at the cha the channel sorry at the pilot location, they can be interpolated, for example, with nearest neighbor in interpolation. So we have this support for different algorithms. And what is coming soon is more advanced MIMO detectors, uh, more advanced channel estimation and interpolation. So we are always enriching channel with new, with new features. Uh, so let me quickly exp uh, work through how Chana, how Shona is designed. Um, to, um, yeah. So first, everything is written in the, everything. Every component is a TensorFlow class layer, and the reason is that uh, that way it is super easy to put together this component to build um, to build an advanced communication system so for example the channel and the and, and, the, and the modulator and the detector would be cast layers and by connecting them we, we can build a links uh, a link a wireless link and if one wants to replace one of these components with an R network all he needs to do is to um, is to implement the neural network as a cast layer and to push it in there uh, between two Shona components as, or as a replacement of Shona components. And so that ensures that automatic gradient computation is natively supported in Shona, meaning you can propagate the gradient through every of these cast layers, assuming the algorithm that is implemented, of course, is differentiable, meaning it makes, it makes sense to compute the gradient. Secondly, Every algorithm, every algorithm use as input and outputs to represent the data a tensor. And the first dimension is the batch. And this comes from the field of machine learning, right? Where we process batches of data jointly. So batches, a batch, for example, of size 128 means that we process in parallel 128 uh, realization, for example, of the link uh, that are independent. And this allows to fully embrace the parallelization that is enabled on GPU. Of course, Shona runs also on CPU. It would just be slower. And the precise shape of the of the of the tensor depends on the algorithm. For example, the first dimension is so the first dimension is always the batch size, but then the subsequent dimension could be the number of transmitter, the number of receiver, the number of receive antenna, the number of FTM symbols or the FFT size, for example. It really depends on the algorithm that is implemented by the chaos layer. Next, uh, because most of the physical layer processing happens on the complex in the complex domain, uh, Shona is supports by default the TF.complex64 uh, data type, data type, meaning that 
the complex number is represented by uh, real and imaginary components, right? But an H of this component is implemented is implemented by a 32-bit floats number. And it also supports double precision, CF complex 128, when we move to 64-bit for every real component uh, as a cost of extra memory consumption. But this is in there. And also, most of the, all of the layers support uh, both TensorFlow uh, executions modes. So there is the eager mode, which is slow, but practical to debug. Uh, and there is the graph execution, which is there to speed up the simulations or the trainings. Uh, but then we cannot see what's, ha what's happening uh, anymore inside be, between the layers. Basically, the model is compiled and run on GPUs. Uh, and Shona supports both of these modes. And also, it supports for most of the layers the new XLA, so that's accelerated linear algebra uh, mode, which is even faster. So it enables even um, uh, significantly faster simulation compared to even graph execution alone. But as it because it is still experimental, some a few layers within Shona do not support it, but most of the layers support it. And finally, we so we can also write a custom TensorFlow operation. For, for, for Shona that are in C++, CUDA or XLA. So this is practical because sometimes some algorithm cannot be represented nicely using tensors, right? So it could be practical to write a C++ uh, with CUDA or XLA uh, operation that then can be loaded uh, in, in by TensorFlow into Shona and run as any other operation. Okay, so let me maybe just now get a little bit more practical and show you uh, a basic hello world example with Shona, how it works. So first, we first we def let's say we want to run just to to, to run uh, a simulation over a WGN channel, right? So we first define what we want to, the some variable that indicates what we want to have, what we want to run. So we set a batch size of one thousand twenty four, a code ordinance of one thousand. We assume here, for example, we use a DPC code, right? And K, the number of information bit is 500, meaning we have a code rate of 0 0.5, right? One half. We use four bits per symbol, which using the standard modulation schemes will mean 16 quam. And we set the SNR to 10 dB. And then the, we need to instantiate our components, right? So here we instantiate the layers that implement these different components. So we have, first we define a constellation. We say we want a quam with these four bits per symbol, so that is 16 quam. We define a binary source, that's our first layer. Uh, so we instantiate it, and then we call it to generate batch uh, code words, information bits, sorry, information bits. So a batch size, a batch of information bits. So we will have 1024 vector of 500 bits, right? That would be randomly uniformly sampled. We run this into the LDPC 5G encoder, and we just specify K and N, and then rate, ma rate matching is taken care of transparently. The user doesn't have to do anything. And we feed it, we feed the, our decoder with the bits, the information bits, and we get out of this decoder the code, the, the code words, right? Then we map these code words into, a con uh, into baseband symbols, right? Baseband, com baseband complex symbols, so quam symbols, basically, because here we use our quam constellation. We send these baseband symbols over the AWGN channel, and we use as a no uh, for the noise power the inverse of the SNR. So here actually it was not dB, my my bad. And finally, we compute LLRs on the receiver side. So now we are on the receiver side. We use a demapper. We we, we choose up demapping, so that's optimal dem optimum de optimal demapping, assuming AWGN channel. AWGN channel. We just specify that we use this constellation, the noise power, the received symbols, and it computes LLRs for us. And then we give this LLR to the LDPC 5G decoder, so that's a belief propagation uh, 5G compliant decoder. We just need to specify the encoder so it knows what to do, fed it with the LLRs, and we get back our encoded information bits, p hat. right? Now, let's say we want to use, uh, we want to do some machine learning, right? So let's say we want to do some machine learning first to train a constellation. So we want to move away from QAM. We know QAM is sometimes suboptimal for some channel or for some SNR regime. So we want to get something better than QAM here. 
And so all we need to do with Shona is to specify that now this component is trainable. What it means concretely in practice, what it means exactly is that the IQ symbols that implement the QAM, right, the grid, is now see, is now seen by TensorFlow as a as weight as a trainable weight. So we give the liberty to the to TensorFlow to move away this point to maybe get something that works a little bit better than in 16 QAM with gray labeling. And on the receiver side, we implement a neural demapper. So let's say we have defined a receiver uh, and on a, a cast layer that implements the that implements a neural network, and we just substitute here our demapper with a neural demapper. Of course, this is an Adobe Gen channel, so we know what is the optimal demapper, right? So we can do the math for that. It's pretty simple. It's just here for to illustrate how it works with Shona, right? It's just an exercise. So we just need we implement our neural demapper. And replace the demapper with the with our cast layer that implements this one. And now, if we want to train, all we need to do is first to define a loss function. And what we use here is the binary cross entropy because it makes sense from an information theory point of view. We know that, and we feed it with the bits and the so the actual bits and the output of the decoder. We compute our loss function, and then we wrap our system in a gradient tape to ask TensorFlow to to tape the gradients, and then we can compute the gradients with this gradient tape of with respect to the loss function. So the loss function with respect to the trainable variables, we, which would be here the constellation points and the weight of the neural demapper. And we could then apply the gradient to update the weights and to improve the neural demapper and the constellation a little bit. So that's it's that easy in Shona to implement a 5G compliant code over a WGN channel, a uh, link, link system with 5G compliant code over a gen channel, and then to improve some of the system with gradient descent. Okay, so uh, if one wants to get started with Shona, uh, we have, the first thing to do is to go on the website when we have the full documentation. Uh, that's how it looks. So we have uh, tutorials, we have the API documentation, uh, and then we have a growing list of tutorials. So this is one of them actually. So we have tutorials that shows how to use the, the codes, the OFDM uh, symbol, the, how to set up, for example, a MIMO, a MIMO, OFDM MIMO system with 5G compliant channels, uh, for example, UMI channel, um, how to set up an R receiver, and how to do some end to end learning. That's a hot research topic. Weighted BP belief recalibration. We have many tutorials that use Shona and that can also be used actually as lectures and that are available online. And the, the actual notebooks are of course all in the GitHub. We have a GitHub forum where we can, you, could, you can ask questions, suggest feature and uh, open issues, of course. We have also uh, NVIDIA GTC DLI training lab, which is online. Uh, you can watch the video uh, to start with Shona. Uh, of course, we have the white paper. Uh, there was also an episode in the Wireless Future podcast that was dedicated to it. And finally, you are welcome to contribute, which, so how it works is that Shona is really, was released until uh, under the Apache 2 license. So you don't need to worry about patent infringement and, litig and litigation. It, this is ensured by the, by, the, uh, by the license. And to contribute, you can start by forking Shona, write your codes, uh, document it. We are really, we, we really, we want to ensure that documentation is of the, a highest quality possible. Uh, we, we, we need also to make sure that everything is unit tested. And then you can submit a pull request. All, we, all you need to do is when you commit is to sign the commit. Uh, that's it. That's the only requirement. Um, yeah, uh, but before maybe contributing, you can also send us an email uh, and make sure, uh, so we can maybe discuss first about any contribution to make sure it is worth spending the time to, to, to write the code and the documentation and the test. And to do that, you can reach us through this e dedicated email address. And uh, finally, what we have added recently, actually last month, is a Made with Shona page where we list every paper that was, that we are aware of and that was made using Shona. And what we ideally, what we list is the paper, the sources, we want to have the sources available, and if possible, 
create uh, a notebook that maybe is on Google Colab. By the way, all the notebooks that are tutorials in Shona are on Google Colab, so you can run them even if you don't have a GPU uh, through your browser. Um, uh, to to yeah to have someone starting with your with your work uh, um, uh, quickly and see how it was done. Okay, so that concludes the first part of this presentation. Oh, well, one, one more thing, and it's a big one. Actually, what we have coming soon is an extension of Shana to handle ray tracing. So that relates to the first, uh, the one of the first slides I have just shown, where we see where we 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 where we highlighted that what is needed for 6G research, we think, is a physical, physically consistent channel realization. And the way we see to get to this is through ray tracing. So what we want to do is to have a ray tracer that jointly combines same scene rendering. So you could see a scene, for example, like this one, where a UE, a base station, and you can render the scene, visualize it, understand what's happening, uh, and at the same and, and also get channel push response for link level simulation. And this channel push response could be then directly plugged into Shona as a replacement of the current stochastic channel models, like the 3GPP channel models, for example, that are currently available, and to start doing working on physically consistent data. So all of that will be available through, uh, could be done through a Jupyter notebook, so you can, in the notebook, visualize your channel input responses and 3D render your scene. And it, it exploits the RTX or ray tracing, the, the, the RTX architecture for very fast rendering and generation of uh, channel input responses. RTX is a hardware architecture dedicated to ray tracing. Okay, so that concludes the first part of this talk. Uh, maybe if, if you have questions, I can... Uh, on this first part, I can take them already before moving to the second part. Hello, hello. Uh, yes, uh, can be audible? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. yeah so I have a question. Uh, you were saying that okay, uh, I'll put it in a different perspective like this. Uh, is your more of a software in loop uh, system or a hardware in loop system? Say I have two software different radios on either ends. I have my yeah. DSP algorithms running on the FPGA uh, respectively. Now let's say I start transmitting baseband or passband samples and uh, use Siona's channel model. So in that case, would I consider Siona's uh, hardware in loop simulation unit or a software in loop simulation unit? Okay, currently everything is uh, all the channels are simulated in software. Uh, okay. uh, in Shona. So if you, uh, yeah. W Something that would be great, but that is currently not available in Shona, is actually an, an interface to uh, to interface Shona with for, with SDR, for example, to to do, for example, to simulate baseband symbols with Shona. So you could transmit bits, code them, modulate them with, with Shona, and but then feed them into, for example, an SDR to transmit them over the wireless over an actual wireless channel. Uh, that's all on the receiver side. Have an interface with the SDR received retrieved the baseband symbols and then use Shona for receive for, for, for processing on the receiver side. Uh, but cur currently that's not available. That would be great. That would be actually a great contribution to Shona. Uh, but currently in Shona everything is simulated on software. So for example when I mentioned these three GPP channel models, they are implemented in TensorFlow following the specification that are available in the three GPP standards. Okay. Th does this answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it somewhat uh, answers my question. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah something I was wondering as well. So currently, as of now, there is no SDR-based uh, support with uh, Shona altogether, correct? Yeah, currently there is not, and that would be actually a very great contribution. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, one more uh, question I actually had was you were talking about uh, different data sets that uh, physically consistent data sets, right? You are you are telling about so if. Uh, if, if okay, down the line for any terahertz or any communication systems research, yeah, physically consistent challenge where our neural networks can actually train on what is possible and what is not possible is very important. So, how would you think uh, a physically uh, what is it? A physically consistent channel can be generated uh, at least in a software base because 
not all of us have the capability to go out and collect uh, field hard uh, field data right okay so the so so the, the 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 best way we know currently is ray tracing that's why we are working on this ray tracer because if you look for example if you look if you use this 3 gpp 38901 uh, what happened is that you, you get something that may is realistic but for example if you move your um, your uh, receiver in these three GPP models by a few centimeters, you don't get something that is physically consistent because yeah, they are stochastic. Remember, yeah. uh, they are still so, somewhat empirical, statistical in nature, right? Yeah, so, but but in the what, what is also available in in, uh, in Shona since the last release, actually since the previous one, is that we have uh, th there is this data set that was generated uh, by the University of Austin, Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And this is this is the um, Deep MIMO dataset, I think the name. And we have this dataset is now Shona com is not compatible with Shona. And we have actually a notebook that shows in the tutorials list. So if you go on the website right now and browse yeah, the list of tutorials, yeah, I have the data there is a notebook yeah. that shows how to load these datasets in Shona. So because that they, they are data set that were gen there are gen there are data set that were generated with ray tracing they are they are kind of uh, static in the sense that uh, the data set are already generated and you have to do with what is what was generated but uh, you could use this deep mimo data sets and load it into shona to generate the to as to use and to use this this channel input responses instead of these stochastic models so that's also something that is now possible uh, since the last three days. All right. Uh, one last question I have with regards to part one is I think uh, you would have also seen me raise the same question in uh, get up, get uh, forums as well. Uh, how is you know the cross compatibility? Let's say with dot uh, mat file. Say I have a RG generated from a dot mat file. How easy or how difficult would it for uh, someone who's having all these channel models under him uh, would produce the dot mat file and uh, degrade the channel and get a equivalent output yeah so you mean if you have for example channel push responses stored as a matlab file right yes uh, exactly yeah okay so so uh, so that the things that that really depends on how uh, of, uh, so i know that for example it is possible to open a mat file with numpy and once it is opened with numpy you can use it in tensorflow for example, as a data set, uh, okay. by the way. So we also have a, a layer in Shona that is called CR data set, and that channel push response data set, CIR data set, sorry, and that you can use to stream from a data set, but you need to, to write the interface with this data set because that's really specific to the source of the data set. And if, you, if this MAT file is compatible, it can be open with NumPy, and I think it is possible. I'm not sure if it is possible with odd MATLAB version, but I think it is uh, for uh, many of them. Then, to the best of my knowledge, you could open it in NumPy and then stream it into Shona uh, uh, to to you through this layer. Sure. And uh, one last question I have with regards to part one is: uh, Let's say I have okay. Uh, let's consider Siona as pure software, as uh, mentioned before. Let's say I have two hardwares that are giving me actual samples. Yeah. Uh, and I have my uh, PMT or my whatever uh, hardware streaming program that I've written. Uh, will it be able for me to use Siona's channel model and degrade the incoming data? I mean, from a theoretical perspective, at least from a random theoretical perspective. Oh, uh, to be sure I understand, you mean if you stream some received baseband symbols, for example, from an hardware? So we yes, stream precisely, the yeah, samples precisely, in a sample? Precisely, yeah, that's what I meant, precisely. Because we cannot afford all these fancy channel models in real life, right? So software is there oh. for us. Uh, yeah, okay, so just to clarify this, these models are hopefully very easy to use. Uh, with China. So I mean, if you want to do simulation using these models, uh, I'm not saying they are... They, they will match exactly the, the lab setup you have, but hopefully with Shona, they should be easy to use. Now, uh, if you want to 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 use, to if you, if you stream IQ symbols out of your hardware, it should be possible to do the decoding part with Shona. Uh, okay. what, what, what of course, I mean, of course, if you provide the accurate information such that the pilot values, uh, the pilot pattern, the pilot values, the 
SNR, the, the noise level, uh, then these are textbook algorithms, most of them, LMMS equalization, the square estimation. So there is no reason why it should not work as, uh, I don't see any reason why it should not work. Okay, Feka. Yeah, those were the few questions I had. Thank you, Feka. Thank you for answering them. I think we can go forward. Uh, Balak, uh, how much uh, time uh, do we have? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, Two more minutes. Uh, yeah, so so I think let let so let's let's stop here because uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, yeah because because I it, I cannot present but but it's fine I mean um, uh, oh, what I can say quickly maybe in one minute is that we have these two work that were made with Shona literally meaning that this is the worst researcher from our group one is about uh, synchronization for NPROJ, so that's for NBIOT. Um, and the code is available here and the paper is on archive. And the second one, pop, 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 that both are, uh, both, both are about to be published at Globcom, but the archive paper are already available. And the second one is about using graph neural network for channel decoding. So it's to, it shows how to implement um, a message passing decoding algorithm that is enhanced with neural network. So GNN are currently very uh, hot topic in the machine learning community. And there is this MPNN, message passing neural network, that pretty fits the how belief propagation works for a DPC decoding. And you can push the, and, and, and we can use this to decode uh, a DPC 5G compliant code or BCH code. And this is what is demonstrated in this second paper, which is also about to be published on at Globcom in December. And the um, archive paper and the source codes are available online. Um, yeah, you can find this on the Made with Shona page, actually. That, that's it for my presentation. Thank, right you for, time. thank you so much for your time. Uh, I mean, we took yeah, your time. My pleasure. Yep. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Balaji, any more questions from uh, YT or Slack? And all right, cool. Uh, that means on to our uh, last and uh, final speaker, Mr. Uh, Sebastian Diodak. So I'll uh, a short introduction about. Uh, let me share my screen before that. Hello. Hey, Mr. Sebastian. Hey, Hope you're doing good. How are you? Yeah, great. All right, so I will I will launch the, the slides. Wait a second. I will just like up, uh, put them in Hello, here. Mr. Sebastian, uh, like Aditya that. here. We just uh, give a short introduction about your uh, speaker profile. Give us a minute, please. Yeah, OK. So Mr. Sebastian Dudak is a security researcher at Trend Micro, and he's also founder of a company called as Penthouse Consulting, specializing in wireless and hardware. I know Mr. Sebastian Durek because I personally used one of his software called as Home Plug Pawn, uh, which connected a Qualcomm Ethereum chip. I mean, uh, it's a fanboy moment for me. Uh, he's also been uh, uh, very passionate about flaws in radio communication systems and published research on mobile security, say, baseband uh, fuzzing, interception, and mapping, etc. He also focuses on practical attacks with various technologies like Wi Fi, RFID, and other communication. For today's uh, event, He's presenting us on assessing 5G IoT devices from wireless to hardware. On to you, Mr. Sebastian. You're good to go. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, I would just like to launch the slides right now, and, and then we can begin. So wait a second. I have to select one window in here, and we can begin. Can you uh, can you see the the slides? Yes, perfect. Yes, Mr. Sebastian. Sounds like it. Super. Yeah. So let's begin. So um, um, I wanted to actually present you and thank you very, mu very much for also inviting me uh, at this uh, meeting because, I mean, it is always interesting to meet every people in the uh, software and radio, uh, I mean, not industry, but uh, I mean, let's say maybe, uh, uh, I mean, ecosystem. And uh, I wanted to actually to introduce you uh, how to assess 5G IoT devices using software-defined radio because actually this is, I mean, software-defined radio, you know, uh, is 
they were possible to do like a lot of stuff, uh, especially available for captures. Uh, you can also interact with uh, um, interfaces, radio interfaces as well, and you can actually apply this knowledge uh, and also tools that have been made by many people in this uh, in this area uh, against uh, some uh, some targets. And for for this presentation, I wanted to actually show you how it is possible to use SDR against uh, 5G IoT devices. So. Um, First, yeah, you know about you know uh, me because I mean uh, now uh, I've been in introduced, but yeah, uh, generally I have created a, uh, I mean a company which is uh, which is actually interested about assessing devices. I'm also doing trainings, but also uh, hardware security. I'm combining actually hardware and radio in order, for example, to extract secrets out of the devices, and that allows me, for example, to for example, let's say that we have like a, a device which is capable of uh, encrypted communications, and I'm not able, for example, to see that there is like any any sensitive data that is coming uh, on the radio interface. I can actually maybe just like use the hardware hacking in order, for example, to maybe have some secrets that I can, for example. Um, you know, use against the communication or, uh, or, you know, the secrets that can allow me maybe to, to scale a little bit attacks, like, for example, attacking the backends in order, for example, to have much more devices than the one that I have uh, actually, uh, I'm actually uh, targeting. But yeah, uh, mostly like this and yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, wait a second, yeah, it's a little bit lagging. So, uh, mostly... This is, I mean, um, I mean, the old state of uh, of my lab that uh, I have actually, because now I have much more devices. But uh, you can see that, for example, I'm like, uh, I'm, I was like a hobbyist at the beginning, and uh, also I became uh, professional on this field because I need actually devices that allows me, for example, to acquire a lot of bandwidth. Uh, I have also some devices that now today are able, for example, to acquire like a gigahertz by, uh, bandwidth in order, for example, to do some large captures and them but yeah mostly that was like the lab that i got like a year ago and that allows me that possible to to i mean to assess 5g devices at the beginning um and so yeah there's like many many devices in here but uh yeah this is just like a part um we have to know that devices mobile network i mean uh, mobile network evolved a lot uh since the beginning on in 1g in 1g there was like not a lot of security 2g brings some security features like for example uh the, um, I mean, the confidentiality of, um, I mean, uh, when, uh, for example, uh, you wanted to do some calls, even, for example, if you wanted to send SMSs, uh, for example, uh, using some services, uh, we have to know that in 2G, uh, there, there was like two case where you can, uh, for example, push some messages on the uh, message information channels in order, for example, to, I mean, to avoid, for example, uh, having to reserve some channels in order to encrypt, for example, all the communication and so on. So you had like one channel which is capable, for example, to to just like uh, send a, a message info, uh, inf information message and also SMSs that were sending clear. But you could also use uh, some uh, specific channels that you could reserve in order, for example, to uh, to encrypt communication as well as SMSs as well. Uh, with 3G, what uh, what we know is that, um, uh, and I will also maybe be reminded uh, thereafter, there was also some other, other evolutions, not only on the radio part, but also in the uh, security point of view, because uh, 3G actually also integrated mutual notification compared to 2G, which is better because, uh, for example, in 2G, uh, you know, for example, an attacker could easily, uh, for example, uh, attract a device and then attack it, uh, for example, to, uh, let's say, uh, intercept communication, but also attack the device itself, uh, for example, the baseband and all the stuff. Uh, in 4G, we have also, uh, I mean, much more improvement on the radio and also in the security in 5G. It is uh, also uh, in 5G, in SA, in, uh, generally, the security is uh, pretty same as in 4G. In SA, there's like much more uh, security feature that were in, uh, introduced. So yeah, uh, mostly, there, I mean, there's like a lot of evolution and we should know that, for example, now we have devices that are capable of handling many uh, stacks. So, for example, as an attacker, if we want, for example, to trap a device, we could still try to, for example, downgrade the communication to 2G, uh, but now it's becoming much more complicated. Um, 
Also, the uh, the networks uh, change a lot because uh, at the beginning we had like uh, you know in 2G we had like a, a BTS connected to a BSC uh, base station controller connected to a mobile switching uh, controller and connected to the voice. But then uh, in 2.5G we introduced like the SGSN and GGSN in order to, for example, to forward uh, packets. Uh, uh, so uh, we could, for example, have like an IP address and also uh, forward the packets and also have like an internet connection. In the 3G we use we use the same um, um, we use the same uh, how to say the the same core network as the uh, 2.5G, but uh, I mean uh, some other things normally change, change also. Uh, in uh, 4G normally it should be uh, a little bit different from uh, 3G and 2G 2.5G, but still I mean sometimes uh, we still have like some some computers that uh, some servers that are reused etc. So normally I mean EPC looks uh, very like that but uh, i mean at the end uh you know it is just like some bricks that uh, that uh, generally uh, uh, uh taking like uh, the old infrastructure and uh deport the old all the infrastructure to the new infrastructure so generally i mean apc is like a mix of old uh server and uh and new uh concept of uh, the 4g uh, in 5G NSA, so what we have is that uh, in 5G NSA we have like um, uh, um especially i mean uh, the only uh, new part in here is the only uh, only the 5G radio. So that means that, for example, in uh, the 5G radio, we can we can, for example, uh, send much more symbols than in 4, 4G. But still, 5G and 4G use exactly the same goal. So actually, there's like no much improvement in terms of, uh, for example, of speeds generally uh, in uh, in the core network uh, itself. I mean. Still, the radio is faster, but uh, in the core network, it doesn't suit what uh, the 5G can offer, actually. Uh, we have actually to wait until having the 5G SA, and in most uh, most countries, like, for example, I know that, I, I think that in Germany, actually, they, they probably move to a I say as well in Finland, etc. But in France, for example, we still have the oh, I mean, the, the 5G NSA, which is actually this case, actually. So, uh, yeah, uh, so that's why also a lot of people do not see actually the the big gen changes are uh, using 5g but i mean it will come normally uh, in uh, in 2023 uh so yeah let's maybe talk about our target so the targets i had at the beginning when um, i was starting for example uh, to to um to um to assess some 5g devices because uh, still it's very difficult to see some IoT devices in production that use 5g modules but yeah i wanted to to be prepared so i've actually actually uh, you know, uh, taking some some uh, some uh, 5G devices that are able for both to talk in 5G NSA, 5G SA, uh, and so here they are. Uh, and I actually use uh, some dev kits also in order for both to just like uh, replace some 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 sort of attacks that I can see. For example, uh, um, um, if you probably look at my, my publication, maybe um, before. Uh, and also other publication, there, there's like plenty of devices that use mobile modules. Like for example, uh, you have uh, intercoms, you have uh, a lot of uh, alarms also that you are, are using this. You have also T-boxes in um, in um, in cars. I mean, there's like a lot of uh, devices that use mobile uh, mobile networks, uh, and they use it uh, thanks to this little uh, module. I mean, kind of this little module that allows for example to actually talk to uh, the mobile network. And yeah, this mobile module is composed of an application processor. So you generally have like normally uh, a processor which is able for example to talk with the baseband and forward uh, the packets. But this application processor can be also, I mean, uh, very interesting because it can help and also, uh, and I, I mean, um, um, an operating system like for example, uh, like Linux actually so which is kind of uh, interesting because some uh, constructors some manufacturers are also using the application processor i mean they are using the sdk uh, in order for example to develop application inside this application processor and that allows them for example to avoid using you know uh, i mean another processor to to for example to to develop uh, an external application that will actually just like talk with the uh, the application of the manufacturer for example so everything can be also developed in the application processor but still i mean you need 
uh, some space also to uh, to add all the, uh, the application you want to include uh, inside uh, inside this module. But yeah, uh, there's like some some manufacturer that actually are using are using this application processor in order for people to develop their application thanks to the SDK provided by the uh, the mobile module uh, manufacturer. Uh, and so yeah, there's like also two frontends, uh, a DRX and a PRX, which actually handles for support the transmission and the reception of uh, all the samples. And you have the basement processor, which will actually process all the, um, I mean, for example, uh, all the uh, the samples on the, on the radio samples in order for example to then uh, decode them, uh, because also it will handle for example the decoding of. Uh, the uh, several uh, protocols, uh, mobile protocols. So uh, also the baseband processor handles a lot of uh, stacks. For example, from 2G, it can handle 2G to 5G stacks, or it can also handle only 5G stacks. For the moment, we don't see like a lot of uh, 5G devices that only handles 5G stacks. It is true, for example, for 4G, uh, NB-IoT or uh, CAT M1 uh, baseband only, because uh, there's like still some embedded devices that are using, for example, some specific uh, stacks uh, meant to be used, for example, for uh, IoT uh, case. But uh, in 5G, uh, for the moment, I don't saw like, like a lot of uh, a lot of devices are using only 5G specific stacks and only 5G specific stacks for IoT uh, purposes. But yeah. Uh, now let's talk about 5G in brief. So very, I mean, very quickly. Uh, so here is the, I mean, the security comparison in brief you can find. So you know that in 2G, I mean, uh, we we cannot say that it's totally broken, but I mean, uh, the chain of trust is a little bit broken because only the uh, the, the the network is able to actually uh, check if a user equipment uh, is legit or not. So first of all, if you act as a uh, fake uh, base station, you can actually allow air, anyone registering to your network. So actually you can try every uh, every possible equipment which will connect to you. Uh, and also the encryption, I, I mean, on 2G still use, for example, uh, A53, actually some devices are supporting it, but a lot of devices are using A51, uh, so it's still in use, and uh, A51, we know that it's broken too. On 3G, we, uh, we, we said that uh, there was like some improvements, but only in the case of uh, when possible the device is uh, using, for example, a USIM mode SIM card. Uh, so if the, the SIM card is uh, very old, or, uh, or this, this SIM card uh, doesn't, is not able, for example, to, uh, to use the US mode, I mean, it will not perform the network notification. So th that means that, for example, this device is also prone to be connected to a fake base station, for example, a fake 3G station. Um, it can be also the case in 4G and 5G, generally the implementation of base bonds are well made, but we can also find some weird uh, implementations, uh, weird uh, behavior uh, in, uh, in 5G and also 4G, 4G stacks. And also you can see that the encryption is uh, much better, for example, in in 4G, in 5G, uh, I mean, as well, there's like the same algorithm that is uh, that are used. So generally, I mean, uh, 5G, uh, 5G and 4G generally don't change a lot. Uh, but 5G SA introduced still some some other features uh, that are much more secure than in 4, 4G and 5G NSA. So, uh, so yeah, as I said, the security mechanism are can like the same uh, in 4G and 5G, unless that, for example, 5G SA, you have some new features that were introduced, but are, uh, these features are a little bit, I mean, not a little bit, but are called optionals, for example, if you look at the the, uh, the specification, the 3GPP specifications. So generally, I mean, for example, uh, in 5G SA, for example, well, what is good is that, for example, the, uh, the the key hierarchy is pretty the same as in 4G. Uh, you have uh, much, I mean, much more diversification compared to 4G. Um, here, for example, in 5G SA, uh, you have, for example, the 5G uh, AKA, which allows, for example, to do like some more checks compared to 4G. Uh, and you have also the Suki, which is actually uh, something that uh, normally, uh, I mean, a lot of people talk about uh, earlier in 5G, about, for example, the way that uh, sometimes um, you have uh, uh, how, how to say that? I mean, um, in the point of view, sometimes uh, you want to, uh, you don't want to be tracked, for example, by 
um, uh, an EMC MSI catcher, for example. So you, are, you have to know that each SIM card has a unique number, a unique subscri subscriber number, which allows, for example, to identify a user. Uh, and so, for example, an attacker can use uh, this, uh, this fact that any MSI will be actually in exchange uh, during a registration, for example. And uh, during the, the registration, someone can actually try to track uh, this user uh, using this fact. And so also, for example, this MSI will actually, uh, when registering to to, uh, to one uh, network, it will get a TMSI or even a PTMSI or MTMSI. But uh, an attacker, for example, following all the exchanges can then track the user, uh, even if the TMSI change, for example. Uh, but yeah, uh, in Forge, um, they introduce also the Guti, but the Guti can be still, for example, attacked a lot. I mean, attacked uh, because we can actually uh, force users uh, to uh, to reuse uh, attached requests in order to get uh, the MSI. Uh, in 5G, actually, uh, there is a use of SUPI, which is a subscriber public identity. So it is, yeah, if you look at the uh, the schema uh, just uh, below, you can see, for example, the constitution of the SUPI, which is like, a, which is a, con a, con a concatenate of the MCC, MNC, uh, MSCIN, uh, and uh, then this SUPI uh, to actually be uh, I mean, encoded as a suki, which will, it is not encoded, but it will be concealed as a suki, will actually use, for example, an asymmetric encryption algorithm in order, for example, to protect uh, all these things. So you will have an encrypted MSI, which will be actually protected. And so an attacker is not able, for example, to, uh, to actually uh, um, um, recognize a user uh, which will actually uh, register to a, I mean, to a network, etc. So normally this, uh, the SUPI is, uh, which is constituted by MCC, MNC, MSIN, it will be, uh, I mean, especially the MSIN, will be secured uh, at some point and will be also, uh, how to say, uh, will not be shown to the attacker. But yeah, this is still optional for example, in 5G, because if you don't have like the uh, a 5G uh, SIM card, which actually uh, has uh, all the parameters uh, on, for example, in order to use uh, the, the SUKI uh, calculation, I mean, the uh, the thing is that uh, still the SUPI will be in clear and uh, send it sent to, uh, to, uh, to the to the network uh, in clear text. So yeah, uh, in 5G, say there's like a, some security feature which improve the security of uh, 5G. I mean, in, uh, compared to uh, 4G, it's like much secure, but still this security feature, I mean, a lot of security features that were introduced are still optional. Uh, so yeah, still in Tsuki, you have, you have some ways also to attack them. You can also do some jamming to downgrade and use some other mobile stacks like 2G, 3G, 4G. You can also find bugs in Bayon. You can also uh, uh, do some regist registration reg uh, rejects. Uh, so uh, meaning that you will just send a packet that uh, will tell that 5 GSA is not allowed. Uh, so there's like also a presentation about that. Uh, like uh, the the one of uh, Ravi uh, talking about 5G MSN catcher marriage, etc. I mean, there's like other ways actually to handle also these uh, these things in uh, in uh, attacker side. Now let's talk about intercepting 5G radio traffic. So uh, so the traffic uh, is something that we want actually to uh, to to look at because when we assess for example 5G devices, we want to uh, to know if for example the device is using for example clear text uh, communication in order to assess the device. Because uh, of course it's uh, the we will use for example custom SIM card in order to see uh, what is going on on the on the uh, on the inter I mean, to inter uh, on the communication while intercepting, but uh, it also. Uh, scenarize, uh, I mean, I mean, it also simulates a scenario where, for example, an attacker can still, uh, for example, attack the core network, get some session keys, reuse them against the radio, and then uh, see what is happening. And if this, uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, user, I mean, this attacker can actually intercept the traffic and de I mean, inc uh, decrypt it, he can also inspect to the communication between the uh, device and the uh, the backend, etc., and probably also like sensitive information between the device and also the backends. 
So traces, uh, for example, devices, we can actually use several tools. And what is good is that, for example, before we had to actually use, and two years ago we had actually to use, for example, Amari Soft. But uh, there, there are some tools that actually can handle 5G NSA, like OpenAir interface. You have also uh, uh, SS Run, which is very uh, easy to use compared to Open Run, which allows you, for example, to uh, to configure it, the uh, 5G NSA codes, uh, and this way you can actually uh, work on the 5G NSA uh, uh, stack. The uh, the problem is that it is still very expensive. Uh, I mean, for example, if you want to use a commercial solution like Microsoft, it costs like a 20 uh, 20k uh, to actually work on that. Uh, 20k do uh, euro or dollars. It's actually dollars and euro are quite the same uh, right now, uh, and. Also, um, yeah, if you're using, for example, open LTFS, it will be probably cheaper, but uh, yeah, still a little bit complicated to use. Uh, I mean, even if the, the the price is cheap. So yeah, generally, I mean, the stacks that are act I I'm actually using, for example, I'm actually using Amarisoft, but also SS Run, and yeah, you have to actually, I mean, uh, I mean, invest some money to actually in, uh, uh, inspect these conditions. And yeah, also it costs like uh, uh, some more money because you need also two data balls uh, to actually support, uh, that are supporting these bands, the bands that uh, we will use, and also the bandwidth that we need. Uh, for the 5G uh, as a case, I mean, it is much more simpler. You generally can just use, for example, one Blade RF or one USB, even the B versions. You can also use uh, USB X versions as well. Uh, maybe Lime is there, but I didn't test it yet. So, but yeah, in this case, for example, for 5G say, as you don't need, for example, exactly like uh, 5G NSA, you don't need to have like a, a 4G network, I mean, 4G antenna, and also a 5G antenna working together, uh, because actually uh, what I didn't talk about is that you need also a 5G antenna and a 4G antenna to work, to, uh, to work because the 4G antenna will be connected to the EPC, and the 5G antenna will actually be connected to uh, X2 link, for example, can be fiber and so on uh, and this antenna we could be directly connected to the e not b and then connected to the epc but you cannot connect directly the gnb to the epc so that's why you need actually two antennas uh, working together uh, and in 5 gsa uh, i mean it is much more simple because you just need a gnb working so i mean uh, even a blader uh, can can uh, can work uh, for, for that point but you need also to uh, to work with custom iSIM cards, for example, because you you need some SIM card because uh, in 5G you know that the uh, the the cell phone as well as the the mobile network needs to get each other. So generally, you need a fastball to configure it to generate uh, some uh, KA uh, some some KI uh, keys an OPC also. Uh, that will be provided also in the G not B side uh, as well, not only on the uh, SIM card because this is some shared secrets you need to actually configure it as well on the G B side. I mean on the uh, on the core network side and on the uh, on the SIM card. You can actually use, for example, the reference uh, that I have also uh, put in the slides. So if you want, for example, to buy like some uh, some nice uh, SIM card that you can customize. Uh, you can also buy like uh, some other uh, SIM cards on AliExpress. Uh, it is like cheaper, but uh, it is also provided with a nice software, uh, which you you probably don't want to use uh, because I mean, generally, I mean, it is compatible only on Win on Windows uh, systems and generally with a lot of Chinese characters. So it's uh, I mean, uh, sometimes just using, for example. Uh, I mean, SIM cards like uh, Sysmocom uh, can work. I don't know actually if uh, some AliExpress uh, uh, SIM cards are working with uh, PSIM and other uh, tools like uh, the one provided by Sysmocom, but uh, can also work. I mean, I uh, didn't try it yet. And uh, yeah, if you want, for example, to custom SIM cards, you need to actually provide, for example, uh, the the IMSI of, uh, uh, for example, you can configure it the IMSI to use, for example, the IMSI, which will be actually also used. Uh, uh, I mean, the same, uh, I will use actually the same MCCMNC at the very beginning. Uh, you can also, uh, for example, uh, configure the, um, I mean, the secrets yourself. But, uh, I mean, PCM will actually generate all the secrets uh, you want to use. For example, if you want to generate uh, new secrets, it will automatically, for example, calculate uh, KI in our PC as well. And then uh, the sequence number will be actually resetted to zero, so we can then provide all these functions to the uh, to to the core network side. 
Uh, and yeah, if you want to use 5GSA, I mean, if you want to use a SIM cards against 5GSAs, you have to actually also, uh, uh, you have the choice. You can actually provide all the secrets to the SIM card in order uh, to actually process the Suki. Or if you uh, don't want to bother about the Suki, you can, as I said before, as 5GSA has some optional uh, security features, this uh, security feature is optional, so you can actually disable uh, it on the SIM card. And as it will be uh, disab disabled, you can uh, actually use, uh, I mean, the Suki will not be concealed and used in clear text, for example. And so you will not to bother, for example, having secrets in the SIM card to calculate the Suki and also uh, secrets on the uh, core side in order to actually decrypt it and uh, authorize the, uh, the user equipment. Uh, also, if you want to, uh, to do your test, it's also maybe um, better to use a uh, Faraday cage. So um, what I'm using, for example, is a Faraday cage like that, for example, uh, which is very, I mean, uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, very, I mean, very cool because I can actually bring it, for example, I can just put it in my car and I can then travel with it and go to some clients. Uh, but yeah, uh, you have also cheaper ways. Cheaper ways also, uh, you have to know that if you use, for example, Faraday like that, for example, using your MNN's box, it can work, but you will have to probably work a lot uh, on the on the isolation because uh, sometimes you will have to use also uh, extra meshes, etc., in order to con uh, contain it, I mean, uh, attenuate as much power as possible. Still, uh, you can, uh, for example, you can uh, decrease, for example, the gain uh, that would be used, for example, by the um, uh, by the antenna, by the 5G antenna. But the problem is will be the device. So, if you want to isolate also devices from legit network, uh, you will probably want, for example, to use for example, the the uh, the Faraday cage as well, and also uh, to be sure that uh, it is uh, it will attenuate as much power as possible uh, to, 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 to avoid, for example, this device to connect to all the networks. Because, for example, if this device uh, is a device that you want to attack, for example, also to downgrade, etc., sometimes it's good also to have like a, a decent uh, fire decage for that. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about uh, how, uh, for example, we, I mean, uh, let's talk about some traps we can also have, like uh, on the on the uh, on the specification, because I mean it can happen that, for example, the specifications that does not uh, tell us exactly the the true. So uh, let's talk about it. So maybe the best, uh, I mean, the best example is probably this one, because for example, you are using um, some references like uh, uh, Kakambos or any references. It will tell you that, for example, the uh, the device is capable of uh, using, for example, the NRSA bands, which is actually uh, good. Good. Uh, good to know that uh, these uh, these bands are possible to to use. So you can configure it, for example, your uh, you. I mean, you 5G. You uh, your 5G gene and G not B to use, for example, these bands uh, to communicate with the device. Uh, you can look at uh, some other configuration in order, for example, to, uh, to use the right uh, channel bandwidth, etc., in order for to, uh, to be able to communicate with these devices. But then uh, you can also have surprise, uh, surprises uh, because some devices actually tell you that, for example, the uh, SA bands are, uh, are supported, but this is not true for all countries. So uh, sometimes uh, some devices, like especially uh, Chinese phones, only uh, can only be used in China, for example, I mean, you especially a Chinese firmware, for example, your European firmware, uh, for example, in Huawei, uh, completely uh, disabled the, uh, the the fact that you can use uh, the ESA uh, ESA mode. I mean, the ESA uh, the ESA bands as well. So yeah, uh, you can you can have surprises. Uh, you can also have like uh, other other tweaks, uh, possible tweaks you can uh, you can do. For example, if the, the firmware accepts ASA bands, but only allows, for example, some specific P element like Chinese P element, you can actually use a Chinese P element to uh, then try if this device is able to join this network. But yeah, I mean, uh, when I was like beginning in this field, um, I just probably spent a lot of time trying to find like compatible devices in 5G ASA because uh, because uh, I mean. There was like a lot of specification telling you the, I mean the, so, so a lot of false informations, uh, all because devices were only supported, I mean uh, using a specific firmware for a specific country, uh, and then um, I, sp I, sp I spent probably like a lot of our time trying to to figure out what why devices didn't work, and so yeah, uh, here we can we can see also the feedback, and yeah the the most common way for generally to see if you are you are 
device is able to uh, communicate in 5G SA is also maybe to use for the, for the 4G stack. Using the 4G stack, you can for example uh, make the device uh, using uh, make the device use the 4G stack in order to connect to your network first, and then look at uh, some capabilities. So the capabilities can tell you a lot about what is supported by the device, especially for example, uh, there's like a mode called N1 mode, which actually tells you about uh, the, the use of 5G SA. So if you, this N1 mode is at zero, uh, that means that uh, generally the, your, your device will not support 5G SA right now. Uh, but yeah, then in terms of success, for example, using your Snapdragon X uh, 5X, you can see that, for example, the uh, UE network capability tells you that uh, the N1 mode is actually at one. So that means that uh, we can actually work with uh, 5G, uh, 5G SA. <laughs> And yeah, then once you, you can do that, here is like an example that I, uh, I use, for example, with Myself, but you can actually use, uh, you can actually have pretty the same also using um, uh, SLS run, unless you will probably have like to, uh, to, to do some configuration first, because uh, in the captures, um, I don't remember if the captures gives you like uh, all these informations, uh, for example, uh, but yeah, you will probably have like uh, to do like some, some debugging, I mean, add some debugging uh, strings or, or um, other stuff, or implement uh, also some uh, some layers uh, to to for example to provide you like a much more variables captures uh, to actually get all of this. But in another Microsoft, you can get it uh, using the uh, the native tool. And then uh, here is the part that is uh, interesting for us because we want to actually extract secrets. So once we are able, for example, to trap uh, in, to, to intercept the communication of our device between, for example, the device and the, uh, the backend, we're able, for example, to see, for example, some secrets like uh, like that. For example, some passphrase. You can also see some uh, PPP configuration as well, for example, and also the APN which is used. Uh, with the device. So uh, using this APN allows us also to, for example, join a specific network and joining a specific network, we are able, for example, to, to probably also contact other computers. So because if you are using, for example, a specific APN, uh, sometimes also manufacturers are using the APN exactly the same way as using a VPN. So, uh, but yeah, still, uh, you can also integrate like some security features. Uh, for example, you can have like also in, in, encrypted uh, um, APN, but um, but in this case, for example, uh, I was able for example, to use one of the devices. It was like maybe I think it was an alarm, uh, and this alarm actually used for example some notification protocol in order to join uh, the uh, the sub network uh, that allows me then to actually uh, talk with other devices and also some administration. Uh, servers, and if I'm able, for example, to integrate like a subnetwork using the, uh, I mean, a specific APN, I'm able for example, to test also some other, uh, not only devices but also servers uh, connected uh, that that to create exchange information between devices, uh, and you can at attacking servers sometimes as these servers are, um, um, I mean. Uh, people think that, for example, uh, as these devices are in a specific uh, subnetwork, and normally this device, I mean, uh, no one is supposed to actually get into this uh, specific network. Uh, yeah, I mean, so servers are not protected at all. They can also use like uh, some very weak passwords. So yeah, generally you can find like a lot of other bugs, not only on the uh, on, on the IoT device. Uh, uh, directly, but also on the uh, infrastructure uh, used by the by the device. Uh, if you are using, for example, some eSIM, uh, for example, if the device is using eSIM, uh, I mean, there's like still some ways because, uh, for example, uh, the SIM card can have. I mean, there's uh, there's like some ways because um, I mean, the the device can also have like two slots for SIM cards, like a one slot for the eSIM, e and the other slot that can be used against, uh, for example, another. Uh, and with another SIM socket that you can, uh, that is probably uh, removed physically, but you can uh, always maybe solder. Um, you can also, for example, replace uh, the legitimate uh, SIM K, I mean SIM card, by your own SIM card. So Sysmocom uh, also provide some nice eSIM uh, eSIM cards uh, with this format, and you can program it exactly the same way uh, as the uh, classical uh, SIM card from Sysmocom, for example, but just using a little adapter like uh, I'm doing in here. This little adapter just like, you know, uh, will take the uh, eSIM, uh, eSIM card uh, in the, on the socket and then link it directly uh, like that so using also the, the small plastic uh, in here. I'm able for support to use a reader 
I mean, I, I can put, for example, the SIM card into the reader, read it, program the secrets, and then resolder uh, the, the custom SIM card into the, uh, uh, the IoT device and uh, force the IoT device to use my network uh, instead, for example, and then look at uh, the, the secrets, the exchanges between the device and the network. But yeah, uh, still, uh, I mean, sometimes, um, as I said, uh, for example, you can have like some nice, uh, some nice things. You can actually have so can just like you know uh, get, extract some nice secrets if these secrets are in clear. But if, for example, the device is using, I mean, a well implemented, uh, for example, uh, I mean, for example, if it is using like a, a secure uh, channels in order to you uh, to to forward the informations. Sometimes you are a little bit blocked, so you need to you need to go deeper. So to go deeper, generally you can also make use of hardware attacks. As I said before, sometimes also uh, users, I mean manufacturers, are using the application uh, processor of the uh, mobile module. So uh, to access to it, you can actually use serial ports, buses uh, that are actually exposed. Uh, and also sometimes uh, you have like some uh, serial port that allows you for to talk in AT or Jack. Uh, so yeah, there's like plenty of uh, of ways. But yeah, if you want to unlock, for example, some uh, some uh, some things, for example, if you want to get into the uh, the mobile module in the application side, uh, for example, there there was like a nice hack uh, that was uh, that was actually uh, used by our, I mean, and also presented by our wealth. I didn't uh, put the the reference, but our wealth found like for example an AT command that you can use for example to for example, uh, execute some uh, Linux commands on the mobile module. Uh, I also found like for example a nice uh, trick that's uh, for example a nice AT command that, that allows you for example to switch for example the mode of the uh, USB and then you can actually get uh, the uh, access to uh, as root on the mobile module and then you can extract the application that are relative to the manufacturer of the of the alarm or the uh, the intercom and then you can also maybe find secrets you can then also find some vulnerability against uh, the device itself or, or against the infrastructure um, if you cannot uh, get that i mean this kind of uh, at access i mean this is not over because you can still like uh, spot some nice test point that allows you for example to or directly switch, for example, the mode of some port to ADB or fastboot, or you can also um, find like a emergency mode, which is called ADL, uh, on which uh, that you can actually trigger. For example, there, there's like some in some mobile module it is exposed directly. Uh, in other, it is not exposed, so you will have to typically just uh, take out the the, the cage, uh, the the metal cage uh, of the the mobile module, and then find like some test point that um, are actually using. Uh, having uh, a 1.8 volt, and so you can sh shock, for example, the 1.8 volt uh, test point uh, on the ground, and you can actually then uh, trigger the EDL mode as well. And if it's, uh, I mean, if it's, uh, you you cannot find it, or I mean, it's not exposed like that, can you can have still some ways, for example, uh, doing like some fault ejection. Uh, so, for example, you can use. Uh, some other uh, fault ejection, like possible, like a uh, uh, power uh, fault ejection. I mean, voltage for the fault ejection. Or we also use MFI. MFI is like great because you can actually, with uh, this little coil, you can actually trigger uh, the uh, the mobile. Uh, I mean, the Qualcomm part in here, which will actually be uh, for. I mean, uh, on which you will actually inject like some faults and you can then trigger some modes like for example you can uh, trigger the bootloader mode like that if it's not exposed or protected uh, and sometimes you can uh, and then use the bootloader mode to uh, for example write uh, maybe a partition which allows you maybe to to recover uh, the uh, the use of uh, use of data for example or you can also uh, trigger the ideal mode uh, in this case for example if you have like this kind of uh, error you can actually uh, you can have uh, an access to emergency mode and with emergency mode you can then use the mode to actually uh, extract all the partitions and extracting all the partitions you will have uh, the application of the manufacturer of the, uh, the the alarm or the intercom or any other device and so then i mean uh, you can find secrets you can use against the device or against the uh, the, uh, uh, the the infrastructure of the uh, of the of the alarm or intercom or any other device or t-box as well 
So yeah, the conclusion is that you know ID devices are using a lot uh, the mobile modules, especially now because we are using 5G and the 5G is pretty everywhere and allows for the port uh, for the device to to move and to be sure that uh, I mean it will be uh, well connected everywhere, pretty everywhere. Uh, I mean. You have to know that uh, using uh, uh, with 5G, we, uh, we still have new challenges because uh, uh, before we were used for the using SDR, open BTS and other stuff to actually inspect uh, the communication. But now with 5G, we have the challenge of uh, of having the uh, the tools, having the devices that are uh, some some I mean somehow well, uh, I mean a little bit expensive. Uh, so it's kind of a new challenge. Before we were very cheap devices. You could actually uh, connect a device to 2G, but still in 2G, it is very difficult, for example, to search for vulnerability because still uh, you have a lot of latencies. So, for example, even if you have GPRS, you can try to uh, do a scan, but this scan will be very slow, for example. So it's kind of complicated. So the uh, way it is interesting to actually uh, use 4G and 5G stack is that you can actually inspect for vulnerability very quickly compared to 2G. Um, but yeah, still it is a challenge. At the beginning, it was like a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, they, they, there was not a lot of tools around uh, 5G. So uh, we had actually to use for example, commercial uh, commercial tools like Avarisoft, also uh, Rode HR tools that were pretty expensive to actually inspect the communication. But today, I mean, uh, thanks to the evolution of SSRAN, uh, Open RTFS, we have some open source tools that we can actually use against 5G NSA and SA devices. Uh, but still, I mean, as I said, it requires you some expertise devices. Um, on 5G NSA, at least, a blade earth and yeah uh, i didn't talk about uh, amdb mmtc rlc mod uh, especially mmtc and rlc mod because uh, actually um, the case that i saw a lot on 5g and because i didn't saw also a lot of uh, a lot of i mean uh, ready to go products uh, pro i mean uh, in production module that, that are using 5g modules actually i only saw like some EMB, mmbb uh, uh, case module but yeah, you have in IoT, you will have also MMTC, URLC, on which I don't have like a lot of feedback yet. But um, I don't know, actually, if uh, if the tools that I use, I'm using, for example, like SSRAN, Amarisoft, and so on, would be actually uh, useful against these stacks. And I don't know, actually, if these stacks also, for example, uh, you know that in 4G, we have like some uh, some 4G specific also for IoT, uh, uh, IoT case. Uh, first of all, you have like uh, the NBIoT, you have also the, the CAT M1 uh, uh, narrowband. The, the thing is that um, we don't know if some models will only uh, support MMTC and URLC, which will actually uh, also uh, be very difficult to to maybe intercept uh, at some point. So we, you will, we will probably have to configure uh, the, the tools that are open source in here to support these bands. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it will be maybe a challenge uh, with MTC and URLC only uh, stacks. So yeah, let's see. But for the moment, I don't have like a lot of feedback. So yeah, if you're expecting some feedbacks on it, uh, I, I will say probably that like we will see. I mean, but uh, for the moment, I don't, I didn't see like a lot of devices using these bands. Uh, and still, yeah, uh, 5G module for the moment, as I said before, uh, are pretty expensive. Uh, because you have to count like uh, you know around the 300 euro to uh, 500 euro to get a 5G module device, uh, which is quite of uh, kind of expensive. And generally, manufacturers uh, do do not want to spend uh, this much money. So that's why also a lot of devices are only uh, using 4G stacks for for the moment. But yeah, uh, we'll see in the future. Uh, you will see a lot of devices using also the the 5G stacks as well. But for the for the moment, I mean, there's like. Um, not a lot of uh, devices that are using uh, 5G. Uh, so yeah, uh, and yeah, that's it. So yeah, if you're interested about uh, other stuff, like for example, if you if you want also to, if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact to, to contact me. You can also look at the website. There's like pretty resources. You can also watch us on YouTube as well. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'm open to it. And, uh, and so yeah, I have finished also the the uh, the, uh, the presentation. So thank you very much, guys. To for listening, and if you have any questions, please ask. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. So, before I go to the questions from YD and uh, Slack, uh, I have a couple of questions from my end. Um, in the slide deck, you are showing a, a log file with a very good presentation of your constellation diagram, right? Was it Amarisoft that you are showing us? 
Yeah, it's actually a Marisoft. So, I mean, you can also use SS1 uh, that will also provide you like a GUI you can actually use to see the constellation. But yeah, I mean, uh, what is good is with a Marisoft is that also shows you not only, for example, what happens, for example, on the RLC and so on, but also, uh, I mean, the constellation. Also, yeah, in the slide deck, uh, if you look at the slide deck in here, for example, I can just like maybe uh, wait a second uh, in here. Up, up, up. Yeah, this is a little bit confusing, but so for example, in the in the Slack deck, uh, they tell you that, for example, you have like some MME or EN, ENB, etc. This, I know that it, it can be like a, a little bit confusing because, I mean, these terms are 4G specific, but uh, yeah. as uh, probably yeah, they, uh, they, they have been probably busy at, uh, for example, adapting everything in 5G. Uh, I mean, here, this is the constellation uh, that are actually applied for 5G and not 4G. So yeah, uh, so that's why, but yeah, generally the terms uh, were not changed uh, between the interface uh, and also the configuration. Sometimes you can find ENB, I mean, 4G uh, terms uh, that were actually uh, are used for 5G SA, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a little bit confusing uh, using for the Microsoft uh, like that. All right. Uh and uh, one more small question from this Samari uh, often. The constellation points are basically the OFDM RG constellation points that we see, right? Each slot being the PSS SSS from the GNB that is being transmitted, correct? Um, you you can see, for example, the PSSS. I mean, you can also see other stuff. So, but generally, I'm not looking at uh, the constellation for for each uh, transmission. But yeah, I mean, you you will find first the PSSS, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that also last... allows you, for example, to. Uh, wait, huh? Yeah, so sorry. Please go ahead, Mr. Sorry, sorry about that. You can... No, no. I mean, uh, you you will still. I mean, this, but I mean, probably not only this. I mean, uh, I I don't know actually if it will, if it will actually gives you like I mean a real time uh, constellation uh, view, uh, because I, I didn't look into that. But uh, I mean, uh, probably it's not only just like the pieces. Okay. And uh, one la one last question I have from my end at least is. Uh, uh, it was said that uh, we can read, we can get the 4G primary co configuration information by triggering attach request, right? Uh, so, uh, triggering attach request is basically equivalent of going through your peerage procedures again, if I understand the, somewhat the basics correctly. So, from my personal like, uh, opinion, at least, in order to trigger peerage, one, the cell condition or CQA should be so low that uh, cell handover and peerage is actually triggered. And this can happen only if uh, heavy jamming conditions are present in a single cell, right? Or focused to a single user. So, in that case, uh, how would you know you trigger the uh, reattach request in the case of 4G? What could be the, the attack uh, on 4G? You mean? Okay. So, one way to start a re-triggering request in the case of 4G is to apply heavy jamming conditions. So, you can you can. You you can still, for example, apply to try to apply jamming, but it's uh, I mean, yeah, much it's more difficult hard because, because uh, PSS signals mm -hmm. are quite jam resistant in nature. Uh, so how exactly. do we actually trigger a reattach request? You know, without uh, going to the jamming route. If you, I mean, if it's okay to answer, you can answer. It's a public forum, but if it's quite sensitive, we don't have to. Yeah, the, the thing is that, for example, if you want to, to do some downgrade attack, I mean, uh, instead of the reusing a jamming attack, uh, which will be much more difficult in 5G than in 4G, for example. You can still maybe expect, for example, some logical, uh, some logical, uh, for example, just by pretending to be like a uh, 5G uh, GNB, you can, for example, send some uh, some requests, which will be, uh, for example, telling that, for example, the uh, 5G network is, let's say, uh, not operant, etc., or this device uh, is not able to do 5G. I mean, it's accepted to, uh, to, to do 5G, depending on, also, some baseband implementation, the baseband will say, hey, I'm not allowed to do 5G, so let's do maybe 4G. I mean, uh, everything depends on, uh, you know, for example, the protocol of uh, 5G itself, on how, for example, the uh, baseband should actually behave, but also the, the baseband implementation. Oh, so okay. you can also trick the baseband, for example, to for example, uh, uh, just stay in 4G. For so the idea some is to get the preliminary peerage information out. For that, we can downgrade and say that, look, your connection has went down, so... You have to peer attach, reattach to me again. So send your peer attach request and all your information. Okay. I mean, you you can, for example, use this kind of packets. I mean, some uh, so, some this kind of exchange, for example, um, uh, like try to reattach. Well, I mean, there's 
if you look at uh, the protocol, for example, just by studying the protocol, we can maybe just trick, for example, the, uh, the, the user equipment to force, for example, the user equipment to use 4G instead of 5G, uh, everything, I mean, is uh, is a matter of understanding also uh, the protocol a lot. Uh, I mean, all the processes, uh, but also can be the uh, the implementation of the base itself. Okay, and uh, we have a question from uh, YT. What makes Suki S U C I so special from Guti in protecting user identity? I mean, the um, the thing is that uh, the Suki actually um, is using a secret which is exchange i mean this is a certificate which is actually uh, i mean so, so some sort of certificate which is actually shared between the network and the uh, the sim card itself so for example the attacker will never get it uh, and also um, you have to know that uh, compared to your team the um, the soupy i mean uh, the clear te the clear text suki soupy should never uh, be exchanged in clear compared to 4g so that means that, for example, if I'm, if, if I'm tricking, for example, user equipment to connect to me in 5 GSA using the Suki, uh, this user equipment will never give me the MSI in clear. I mean, the, the Supi in clear. In contrary to 4G, in 4G, I can actually yeah. get the in MSI after, when uh, possible. In 5 only pretty much everything is mutually encrypted. Uh, in 5G, everything exactly, is exactly. mutually that. encrypted. So, so generally, I mean, automatically, um, as a network, I will never recognize the, uh, the user. All right. All right. Uh, Mr. Balaji, any more questions for us from Slack or YT end? All right. All right. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for spending your valuable time. I know there's a conference happening right now in Europe and, you know, you have to rush back to that location as well. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm just like on the weekend, but it's uh, also pretty hard on the weekend too, actually, yeah, because to feed the, to feed the baby, etc. It's like complicated, but yeah, I managed to actually get the time to to do that. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for your uh, time, Mr. Sebastian, and uh, thank, thank you, you for the for invitation. Presentation, Faika. So thank you. Yeah, this you know marks the end of uh, event five for uh, South Indian SGR user group. We Thank all our speakers, uh, Mr. Tilak Maripila, who has already obviously left the meeting. He has a family emergency. And uh, Mr. Faikal for a wonderful presentation on uh, Shiona. And uh, Sebastian Dudak for you know taking out his valuable time uh, and spending it with us over the weekend. I mean, uh, I hope you know to have you guys back uh, with us in the future for some more interesting presentations. And uh, sure, uh, we'll stay in touch with you. Our uh, next event for uh, South Indian SGR user group will be scheduled uh, on the month of February. Uh, you can uh, follow us on uh, YouTube, Slack, uh, Twitter, and currently we have a WhatsApp group as well. Group as well. Uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Fika. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Yeah.